How are you doing? This is David W. Williams. And today we're going to do a movie review of a movie called Dumb Money. And this movie was recommended to me by Erica Williams, Classy Clump Smartphone Money. We're going to talk about this movie, talk about some of the things that we liked about it, we didn't like about it. Talk about the overall theme. And I'm going to try to kind of add my perspective to the movie because I'm somebody that is actually in the markets. I remember uh, when this situation took place. And for people that don't know, this situation is kind of about the GameStop situation that happened around two years ago now. And for people that are not familiar, GameStop was trading probably under $10 and eventually got up to be trading at around $200 in probably less than six months. And so there was a really, really strong run on this. And it became almost like a movement in the you know online space and the online message board space with a lot of retail traders. But there also were a lot of people that were not aware of this situation because it wasn't something they talked about. So now that the situation has each reached its end, they decided to do the movie about it, you know, as a way to kind of take it, take advantage. And I'm not saying that from a negative standpoint, but to take advantage of some of the things that went around this situation and some of the nostalgia around it, even though it wasn't that long ago, but it seems like a long time ago based on everything that was going on. So we're going to kind of go into this movie, what I think about it, because like I said before, as I have a perspective of somebody that actually can trade, I'm actually a trader. I'm actually in the markets. And I do remember when this situation started. I was in it early. I got out early because it really wasn't something I was really paying a lot of attention to. And I don't necessarily trade what everybody else is trading. And I don't care if everybody else is making $10 million a minute over there. There's a lot of reasons why I don't do it. It's because, you know, that's personally how I like to trade. And we're going to kind of go into that. So first off, right, the overall story to me was very well done. Watch the whole movie. And because I come out of the independent film space, come out of the creative space, I look at movies differently than the average person. Screenplay was written by two people. I forgot who the director was. But the overall story was very well done. There were not a lot of gaps in the story. They didn't leave a lot of loose ends at the end of the story. We saw at the end of the story, you know, kind of how everybody's life turned out. So they kind of wrapped up all the different characters. They didn't overdo it, in my opinion. The movie was kind of level, the whole movie. You had ups and downs, but the movie was pretty much level. It wasn't over the top. It wasn't super depressing. They kind of kept it on this level. They created the problem. They created the, you know, the plot point. What was the story? What was the challenge? The character overcame the particular challenge, and then he, the, you know, the, the movie ended. So the story was very well done, in my opinion. What we had is 105 minutes of runtime. The movie moved fairly fast because we had a shorter runtime. And this reminded me of older movies pre-2010 that were around 90 minutes. So when I started learning how to do screenplays, they would tell you, make every page last a minute. So then if every page lasts a minute, you know how many pages you need to have to get 100 and to get 90 minutes. I'm sorry. And so that kind of was a format you were operating under where you want every page to last one minute of screen time. This movie was a little bit longer than that, by about 15 minutes. However, it went very fast because they didn't spend a lot of time right on screen time. And I like that because it allows you to sit down, watch the movie, get something out of it and go into your next situation. We're in an era now where movies are lasting well over two hours, sometimes lasting two hours and 30 minutes. And I think that can be a challenge to keep the story interesting during that time period. OK. And knowing you know, how we make movies, uh, our and 90, I'm sorry, an hour and 30 minutes or an hour and 45 minutes of actual screen time, it could be 600 minutes of film, right? And so now, you know, one of the things, advantages of these computer type movies was everything's a bunch of CGI, is you don't have to film as much. You got a long post-production, but we're not actually doing filming. So we just got a room, a bunch of guys working on computers, and they're actually doing the movie for us. As opposed to a movie like this to where you actually need people on set, you need locations, things of that nature to actually do the movie. One thing I want to talk about that I didn't have in my notes is that the movie did a really good job of setting. It was really what we call in movies a period piece, right? And what I mean by period piece is that you create the aesthetics of the movie, you create the move, the music, you create the terminology and the phrasing. 
to where when somebody watches the movie, they know what time period is. So let me give an example. There's a lot of teen movies that came out when I was a little kid. They were real big in the 80s. They still make them, but they just make them differently than they made them back when I was a kid. And you had this long run of teen movies in the 80s where if you look at the movie, look at the clothes, look at the styles, look at the cars, look at the terminology and the phrase, and look at the music that was played in the movie, you know what time period is, right? It's very, what we call a period piece. Another example would be if we do, uh, I was, it's a movie called Unforgiven, put out by Clint Eastwood in the early 90s. What a movie is, I think it was in either Wyoming or Kansas in the late 1800s. You can tell that based on what? The clothing, the language, the uh, things in the movie, the setting. So it's what we call a period piece. And what we mean by that is that the movie is not set in the present time. Right? Now, one of the good things about a period piece is you want everything in the movie to be congruent. So now we're kind of like getting really into the movie. So you know, a lot of people may not be into this, but this is just what I'm going to talk about. So when it's a period piece, what you want is everything in the movie has to be very congruent to the time period. So what we do is we get with, we normally have a, a, a person that is a director of, I don't know what you want to call it, but their job is to make sure everything in the movie from the computers, the clothing, the cars, all of this is congruent with this time period. And they did a really good job of that. An example of not being congruent to a time period if anybody watched Two Clone Tyrone, if you noticed, they used using cell phones, but the guy at the house picked the phone up on a landline. I don't know anybody that still has a landline anymore. Right? So if you watch that movie, a lot of people are not going to pick that up because they, everybody watches movies differently. When I watch a movie, the first time I watch the movie, I'm looking at the movie technically. I'm really often not even enjoying the movie. I'm looking at the movie technically when I watch the movie because of my background I come out of. So if you look at Who Cloned Tyrone, the guy is outside and he gets on the cell phone to call somebody. The guy picks it up on a landline. And it's an old school phone with the long cord that used to be up on the side of the wall. It's one of those type of phones. I don't know anybody that still has those. I'm not saying they don't exist. I just don't know anybody. Right. If you look at that movie, the cars were older. Right. But there was no indication that we were like in the late 80s, early 90s. But even though the style of automobiles they were using were older, the music was older. Right. But we're using modern cell phones. OK. The only people had cell phones back then was the military. So that really wasn't a period piece, but it also wasn't set in the present time. It, they did that purposely. And the reason why they did that is so they don't get locked into a time period. So what I liked about this movie is that. You're watching it. People got the mask on their face. Well, we know now that that's going to always lock us into a time period. Until the day we pass away, if until if unless that happens again, anytime we see a picture or movie, anything, and everybody walking around with masks on their face, we know what time period that was. And young children who may watch this movie five or six years later, they'll remember that time period because why? They lived it. Right. So you got kids that was in elementary school when this happened. So they're going to I'll never forget this time period where everybody had masks on their face. Like I remember when Challenger blew up, there's certain things you're never going to forget because you lived through it. Right. So they was very congruent with that. Also with the music. Um, also with the way people talk, the way they spoke and the style of the clothing, it, everything kind of was in line. And I really liked how they did that attention to detail because those are kind of things I picked up. Right. So they they accomplished that, okay? And we talked about the story was pretty much well done. So what they did next was they established this guy named Rowan Kitty, who's the guy in the picture, as the main character and the protagonist of the calls, right? So what we did was we did very simple uh, character development of Rowan, of Rowan Kitty. Uh, didn't really do a lot of character development of the other minor characters, but he was like the main guy and the protagonist of the calls. And they did a really good job of that. Um, they explained his justification for his actions, which is the most important thing. Because when you're watching the character, you want to know what, why they're doing what they're doing. So they kind of explained the reason why he was going down this road and what he was going through. They got a little bit of his family life. We knew he had a wife, he had a child. I think they talked about his sister passing away and just what was his motivation. 
And they did a really good job of explaining that. So we're not just watching this guy make movements and we don't understand what's going on. Now, rolling into right, the cause, right? The cause of this whole movie, Rowan Kitty and all the other minor characters was a stick at the Wall Street, right? And they kind of started that off initially where he was talking to his friend inside the restaurant. And he was like, I'm going in on GameStop. And the guy was like, well, you know, Wall Street is short that company. And then it was like, yeah, but I believe in it, yada, yada, yada. Okay. And with the two girls in college, the language that they were using, you know, she told a story about her father worked for this particular, I think it was a grocery store. And it got bought off by a hedge fund. And he lost his job and yada, yada, yada. I mean, that happens. But I, I think the narrative of that short sellers are negative is something that came out of this community. You don't have a market if you don't have two sides of the market. So the narrative to me, and it kind of showed in how this movie played out, is that the only way the market can function if everybody is on one side of the trade and anybody that's against the trade is kind of like trying to turn the market into like a sports team where we're in favor of the sports team and everybody that's not in favor of the sports team but want to see us go to the Super Bowl and win the championship, they're against what we're trying to do. You know, and that's how some people see everything, right? So I get it, you know, because politics has really conditioned people to see everything like that. Politics and political entertainers have really created that us against them mentality. And then people kind of transfer that to every scenario of life. You don't have a market if you don't have two sides of a deal. So somebody has to be for stock. Somebody has to be against it to create markets. Without somebody being for it, somebody says, I believe this company's worth $100 a share. Somebody else has to say, I, work, I believe this company's worth $95 a share. Somebody else has to be, I have believe this company's worth $110 a share. If everybody thinks the company's worth $100 a share, well, you can't buy it at $100 a share because once the amount of shares are gone, we now got to sell it at a higher price. Then if everybody believes it's worth $100 a share, then how do you get shares because nobody sells it to you? But this is understanding how markets actually function. But they kind of were pushing the narrative to where these funds that were short GameStop were negative. The question I would ask, and I was asking people when this play was going on, especially like the younger, the two girls in college who were younger, they looked to be, you know, at that age, you're probably 19 to 21 years old. Have any of you ever been inside a GameStop? Have you ever gone to one? What? What about GameStop and the actual experience makes you believe they even deserve to be around? How many of you gone inside GameStop? I knew GameStop growing up as a place to where they would try to lowball you on game sales. Like you would try to pawn your game back to them and they would just lowball the hell out of you. That's why I used to trade games and never sell them. Because they know in the world I'm going to buy a game for $40 and I'm going to sell it to y'all for $15. It's not going to happen. And I'm talking about a game that's damn near brand new. But that's, that's how they made their money. So I don't think a lot of these people have even been to a GameStop. So there was a reason why GameStop had kind of went down is because the internet created other options to not have to deal with GameStop. It was a time where GameStop pretty much was everywhere. And so you had to deal with them or just not deal with them. You had Babbage's, you had some other game stores. But I remember GameStop from a lot, it's been around forever as far as me growing up with video games. So I grew up in the console era where everybody started buying the consoles. So I, I remember GameStop being around forever. It's a reason why people stopped going to that outfit. It had nothing to do with hedge funds. They lost their, they lost their customer base way before the hedge funds came in because of how they did business. But some 21-year-olds don't even remember that, right? Because they weren't around when this stuff was going on. Or they were, they were too young to remember it. Okay? So it was interesting when this was going on that a lot of the people that were proponents of GameStop if you ask them, have you ever gone to a GameStop? They'd be like, no. OK, but so that's whatever. So the cause was we're going to stick it to GameStop. OK, cool. The other minor characters to show how widespread the problem was. Right. And they all they were all cast in a sympathetic role. So outside of the hedge fund, people, I'm talking about all the people that was in this trade. Were all cast in a very sympathetic role and they all had several things in common. So that's one thing I did like, and I said before that this movie was very well done. They created these other minor characters and they were sympathetic characters where you were supposed to identify and connect with them. And they all had several things in common and that's what I did like about it. But it was showing us how widespread the problem was. Really the problem was, was an economic issue. 
So this is something we've been talking about on this channel a very long time, is you have a lot of people that have similar economic issues. They differ on skin color. They differ on what part of the country they live in. They differ politically based on what they believe their political ideas are. They differ politically. They may differ in religion. They may differ in their sexual identity. What they all have in common is their economic issue. And what happens is that everybody gets separated on those things and don't realize what we all have in common is our economic issue. So we had the two young people that was in college that were in negative debt. Like they owed over $100,000 to that school. We had the guy working at GameStop who had either a negative or very little net worth, you know, kind of just spinning his wheels on the job. You had the woman working in healthcare who had a negative net worth. First responder taking all the risks during COVID and she's going through it. Then you had the, this guy, the main character, I think he had a, I think I said he had a $90,000 net worth, which is not bad. That's more than most people. And he was doing well, but he wasn't doing great. So he had a home, had a wife, had a car, he had a job. He was gainfully employed. But there was really no mechanism for him really to get forward in the world, right? Then you had like his brother who was kind of living on the fringes. So they did a really good job of showing the connection economically to all those people. Because none of those people talked about religion. None of those people talked about politics. None of those people sat around and talked about the sexuality and sexual politics. Like everybody realized what we have in common is our economic situation. And so that's what they identified on. So you notice other people will come in to separate you based on everything else except that. Because why? They don't have a solution for that. So the only solution is I need to silo you around this other stuff because I don't have a solution to your economic situation. Right? And the, and the system's not going to compensate me for solving that problem. They'll compensate me for separating you based on this other stuff. So you're going to still have that problem after the separation, but you're going to get caught in the separation. And what I liked about this movie is it showed that everybody had that in common, right? So some of the things they had in common, we talked about low net worth and negative net worth. So most of the, the, the minor characters, and including the main character, had a low net worth and negative net worth. Now, we were saying that $90,000 for the main character is not really low, but I don't know what the standing of living in the average net worth of is in the Massachusetts area, right? But everybody else had a pretty much a low or a negative net worth, and they were gainfully employed people. They weren't bums living on the street. Now, the one guy who was his brother was supposed to be kind of like a slacker, you know, drug type guy, the comedian that played that role. He did a really good job playing. I've never seen him in anything else. He did a really good job playing that role because that fits his lane. He's a guy that allegedly does a lot of drugs. and does his thing. OK, cool. But it wasn't a stretch for him to be that guy. He did a good job playing that role. So he was like at the bottom of the economic totem pole. But there's people out there living like that. And they're not bad people. They just haven't found their place in society yet but they're not bad people. So he kind of showed us that guy. You had the guy working at GameStop living with his parents, right? Wasn't a bad person. The man went to work every day. He just kind of hadn't found his, his way in America yet. Then you had the woman who was the nurse working extremely hard trying to take care of two children. Either she was a divorcee or she and her husband split up. She's working extremely hard, first responder, taking a lot of risks during the pandemic to support other people. And, you know, she doesn't really have a lot to show for it. Then you had the two kids that was in college, right? They're taking on a lot of debt to try to figure out a way to find their place in this particular society. So even if they come out of school, they come out of school owing over six figures. And so everybody realized like this don't work, but nobody's really provided a solution. So they latched on to this as a solution because they all came to the realization that my real issue is economics. It's not all this other stuff these people are feeding me. And I think that's what made this movement so powerful. And then, like I said before, if you notice, none of these other people in this environment, right, during this time period, came in with a solution to that problem. The solution is going to be everything else. If you notice, none of these people came up with the idea, we just got to, we just have to vote the right person in for president. That wasn't a solution, right? But that was real big during this time period is arguing over who the president is supposed to be. None of those people came up with that idea. We just got to get the right president in the office and we all, everything will work out. None of them realized that that was the solution to the problem. They realized that our issue is economic. They don't see a way out of their situation, right? So you got a lot of people working that don't see a way out of what they're going through. And I've been there. I've been a young person working and it's not what I thought it was going to be. It's not doing for me what I wanted to do, but I don't necessarily see a way out of the situation. And a lot of people go through this.
And what happens is over time, they just get jaded and they say to themselves, well, there's never going to be anything except this. So then what they do is they try to figure out how to create their life within those particular bounds to make it acceptable. But they can't figure out how to get my way out of it. And that's why I said they start getting focused on those other things because they can't see, they can't figure a way out of the economic situation. And nobody's providing any solutions, right? So they're just spinning their wheels. You know, the guy working at GameStop, right? Unless you're going to go into management, you're never going to really make no money there. He didn't like the job. He didn't like the rules and regulations, but it was an easy job. He could do it. He could get paid, right? The guy um, working as the DoorDash curry or whatever, just spinning your wheels. You know, the woman working in healthcare, just spinning your wheels. You're not doing anything negative, but you're really not moving forward in this world. Right. The two people in college, you know, they're in school, but what they got to do to get through school is to take on so much debt that debt can essentially hamper their economic upward mobility the rest of their life. And that's something that nobody wants to talk about. You know, we got a system in America to just to try to normalize yourself in this system. You got to take on six figures worth of debt before you're 25 years old. And you're not even like not like you're going to school to become a doctor or an attorney. Right. You're going to school just to get you a regular college degree. You're going to school to get a healthcare degree as nursing and you're taking on a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. Like that's really absurd, but that's the system we currently have. Right. So everybody just felt like they were spinning their wheels and they were ready to be attached to something. So one thing, if you understand a uh, social revolutions is social revolutions sweep up the people that are disgruntled, they're upset, but they're ready to be attracted to something. The people that are complacent, that think everything is fine and they don't want to do anything. We talk about the people that get jaded. They often don't even get involved until we hit critical mass. So that's one thing about GameStop. GameStop played didn't attract everybody. It didn't attract me because why I was already doing something about my economic situation before GameStop even came up. So it wasn't attractive to me. If I didn't have anything going on, it probably could have been attractive to me. But because I was already involved in doing something about my economic situation, I just pretty much stayed away from it. Right. But those people are ready to be attached to something. And I'm here to tell you, we're going to keep seeing this. Right. We've seen this type of what I'll call populist economic movement. Happen over and over and over and over and over again. And there's a reason for it. And it's because there's a lot of unfulfilled desire in the market. And so it gets placated with race. It gets placated with religion it gets placated with sexual identity politics it gets placated with sports it gets placated with all these things because nobody's really going to come in and really solve the problem those people were ready to be attached to something based on what they were currently going for now let's keep going so the us against wall street works for the movie however in my opinion it's not a way to trade the market so one of the reasons why i wasn't a big fan of this movement is like i said before is because i'm not I'm not doing the us against Wall Street thing. Um, yeah, trading is a zero sum game. Any market based activity can be zero sum. But this us against Wall Street, you know, we're going to tear down the hedge funds. I just because I know how the markets function, it wasn't something I was going to be able to buy into. And I wasn't going to sell it to other people if I didn't believe in it. A lot of people during this particular time period. They promoted that narrative just to try to figure out how to make themselves successful. Right. Because you, you get this. Anytime you have a movement, you have true believers and you have people that just they're riding the wave because this the wave. I don't believe in the us against Wall Street narrative. Right. So I don't believe it's a way to trade the market. I just don't. And so that's why this movement really wasn't attractive to me, because. I didn't really understand how this was going to work long term. And I think the movie kind of played that out. So it is what it is, but I don't believe personally it's a way to trade the market. And what I try to do with what we do with our education platform is first one, teach people how the market actually functions and then teach people how to actually trade the market. And we don't use it's us against it. We don't do any of that. People got enough issues without me creating more enemies for them. You know what I'm saying? Like people, in my opinion, people in their real life got enough stuff going on 
or I now got to create a new enemy for them. I'm just not into that. But that's me. Everybody's different. Characters left thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the market trying to put points. So this is the downside of it's us against Wall Street. You know, that's the downside of it. Leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars in the market trying to pull a point. And we saw this in the movie. Woman working in healthcare, put a few thousand in. I think she was up half a million. Uh, you got to be crazy not to take half of that out of the market. You just got to be insane. You got two children. You got to be insane to not take half of that out of the market. Like, that's insanity. Talking about what he's still in, Rowan Kitty's still in, so I'm still in. That don't have anything to do with you. You don't know his situation. That's like the people that say, I buy a stock because Warren Buffett bought it. And if you look at Warren Buffett's 13F, the stock you're talking about is less than 1% of his overall fund. If that stock tanks, it doesn't change his lifestyle. Right? Warren Buffett's at a point in his life where he can't go broke. So no matter what he buys now. So there's no insight in buying what Warren Buffett buys. But this is how people think because human beings by nature are group-oriented animals. So we take our cues from the group as to what we do. That's why the group that you're in is extremely important because humans by nature are group oriented animals. So that's why, you know, your success in life often is going to be dictated by the people you're running with. So these little groups and cubby holes you're in where there's no progression, there's definitely no economic progression. There's no social progression. It's just people being mad every day about everything or, you know, they trying to backdoor you into some weird stuff. But when a person can leverage your frustration and your anger to do these things and you don't know that, you know, this ain't going to go the way I want it to go, you get caught up in it. So being so mad about hedge funds and, you know, market makers like Citadel, who, you know, controls 30 percent of the market, you can't get around them. Right. To where you leave thousands, if not hundreds of thousands in the market trying to prove a point. Is ridiculous to me. Same thing with Roaring Kid. He was up 50 million at one time. There's no one in the world I don't take 30 million out of the market immediately. The guy lives in Massachusetts. You got a 5% tax rate. You're going to get taxed at 37%. You'll come away with a minimum, minimum 15 million, right? You still leave the other 20 in there. Really, I may say the hell with it and take out 40. So I can keep 20. Pay the government their taxes. With 20 million, you never got to work again. Never got to work. You can get 20 million at 20 years old. You never got to work again. Right. Buy you a house, buy you a car. Right. Get you a platinum insurance policy because now you got enough money for your money to make you money. You just can't go crazy spending money and you can't buy a you know, five million dollar house. Get you a real nice house for a million dollars. You may not even want a million dollar house, but you can get you a real nice house for a million dollars out in the country somewhere and you're good. Your money can go work for you. There's no way in the world. I got 50 million dollars. I put in 50,000. I got 50 million and I don't take 40 out of the market immediately. I come back with 20 and now I can keep the 10 in there and whatever happens, happens, but I got 40 out of the deal. There's no way in the world I don't do that. But you're trying to prove a point. Who are you trying to prove a point to? Because you ain't proving nothing to me except you don't know how to trade. So I'm trying to figure out who you're trying to impress. And so that was the downside. The dude that worked in that GameStop, he eventually pulled some out. Right. But he didn't get what he could have got. And the two people in school, they pulled some out. But the woman that got left holding the bag was the woman working in healthcare, And she needed the money because why? You got two children. So you up half a million. And at the end of the movie, she was negative 13,000. I felt very bad for her, but I didn't feel bad for her because you had all the opportunity to leave the market with your gains. And you didn't. You had the run of your lifetime. Right. And you didn't leave. So this is where the education comes in. You know, one of the things I'm going to try to do at my event is teach people how to keep some of their money. Because a lot of people churn money in this market. And when they leave, they don't have nothing to show for it. But while they was in the market, they had hella money. Why you ain't walk away with nothing? Because of what they did while they was in the market. Right. And I think that was really important. And I don't think that should get overlooked is them people leaving hundreds of thousands of market just to prove a point. It wasn't that the market turned on you and you didn't see it coming. You knew what was going on. You know you up and you're trying to prove a point. Like I said, who are you trying to prove a point to? Because if you a woman with two children, the hell with some dude on the internet you don't know. Who is he? You need to be thinking about your children. 
that five hundred thousand dollars, like I say, even after taxes, because I, I didn't know what state she was in. Thirty seven percent federal tax rate It's a trade. It's not a long term investment. So you're going to get taxes, regular income. Hell, at least you're going to get two fifty out of the deal. Minimum, you're going to get two fifty. Right. You can secure your mortgage. Right. And you can put some money away for your children. You still going to have to work. But your children going to have a situation where they not going to have to be stressed out about certain things that you might have had to be stressed out. That's a blessing. That's a blessing, in my opinion. You came up. So, you know, when you get put in position. I wouldn't block my blessing trying to be obstinate. But everybody different. And I had to learn this the hard way, too. So they had to learn with 500,000. I didn't have to learn with that much money. But I wouldn't block my blessing trying to be obstinate. But, you know, everybody different. When you trade, it can become it can become seductive, right? You have to trade your plan and not get caught up in the money amount. Trading can become very seductive. I learned this before I was trading to where we used to have this term in online marketing, say people that can make money out of thin air. And a lot of people that can make money out of thin air doing online marketing, they get seduced by that because they don't have to go to a job to make money. They don't have to make a product to make money. And I'm talking about a physical product. They don't have to go through any of that R&D, prototyping, any of that. Right. They don't have to actually do a service to make money and build out a, a service business with infrastructure and customer support. They just can create an online product and make a lot of money because they got an audience that can become very seductive. Right. It can become very seductive. Guys doing launch formats and pulling in a quarter million dollars a launch to do that three times a year. Right. You now move to trading when you can trade. And there's a video on YouTube with me and uh, Mecca doing a testimonial. And she talked about during the pandemic, she had her first thousand dollar day. Right. Most people don't know what it's like to put trades in and you wake up and you got a thousand dollar increase on your on your capital. Or you trade during the week. And you pull in five grand that week just on trades. Right. Or three grand or four grand, even greater than that. They don't know what that's like. And that can become very seductive because it's a power that you now have. That you had didn't have before, you know, uh, the largest retail inside the United States has over a million people working for them. The majority of those people don't work in management. The majority of those people don't work in their warehouse. The, a large amount of those people that work for them are going to work all month. They're not even going to make two thousand dollars. So then now you go into the markets and you put some money on this ticker. And four weeks later, you put in three thousand and you sitting on fifty thousand. Right. And the question is, what was your plan? Because if you don't have a plan coming in, how you was going to leave. You could get caught up in the money and now you start believing, well, let me see, can I get a little bit more out of this deal? Because you think I'm always going to be able to get out when I want to get out. The market don't always work that way. The market going to move when it moves. And if you in the way, it's going to run right over you. That's how the market works. So you on the side of it when it's going up, but you don't know when it's going to start to turn down. And if you in the way of it when it turns down, it's just going to run right over you. You ain't going to better stop it. So that's why you got to have a plan coming in. So if I'm going into GameStop, I'm saying I'm going to put this amount of money in the deal. And when we hit this particular profit target, I leave. That's what risk management does in professional spaces. You're a professional trader. You allocate this percentage of the fund to this particular play. We allocate a target exit. When we hit that target exit by this particular date, we leave. If we hit it before that date, we still leave because we hit our target exit, right? Then we also have on the downside, if we hit this right loss amount, we still leave too. So we have an exit on the upside, exit on the downside. Now here's where the discipline comes in and where you got to execute. When you work for a firm, they're going to make you trade it out. They'll make you do it. Because it's their money. So you don't have a choice of whether or not to do it. When it's your money, you can have a much wider risk parameter. Which means what? You can get yourself in a lot more trouble. And so what we saw was people that did not have a plan. Your plan can't be when this guy on the Internet who I don't know says it's time to leave. That's when it's time to leave. Who the hell is he? You don't even know who this dude is. This dude could be a cop. And I'm not saying that to be derogatory. What I'm saying is that you don't know who this dude is. So I'm, you know, I'm talking to how we used to talk when I was coming up. We were like, well, who is this person? Yada, yada, yada. I don't know. Well, he could be a cop. You don't know who this person is. Right. And we're not saying that to be derogatory to a police. I'm just trying to give you an example. If you don't know who this person is on the Internet that's telling you, hey, I'm in this deal. 
you decided to join him and then you start putting inside your head, well, I'm not going to leave the hilly. Who the hell is he? If you fall flat tomorrow, he going to send you some money. So that was weird to me. And that's why I said I wasn't a good candidate for this, for that particular community. Cause I don't do nothing off what that man. I don't know who this person is. I wasn't raised with him. We don't have no kind of relationship. I have not met this person in real life where I can eyeball this person to get a sense for who they are. I don't know this. There's somebody on the internet. But it's the seduction of the money that'll start making you think you're somebody that you're not. And so when you now can invest in something and you know you look up and you got a hundred thousand in an account, you can start thinking you're somebody that you're not, and you don't know how to trade. You just having a run right now, and you was lucky on this ticker. And ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm here to tell you, it's so much money in the market, it'll blow your mind. Because that play made a lot of people millionaires. And you know what? There was no negative impact to the market. If you try to pull that kind of money out of your job, your job will probably go under. And that's what I want people to realize. There's so much money in the markets. You and your crew could pull out $100 million next year and nobody would notice it. That's how much money's over here. And that's one of the reasons why they don't want regular people in these spaces, right? Because they don't want you thinking it's a way out that they haven't told you is the way out. They don't want you ever to believe that, right? So they want you to think you got to do something illegal. You got to do something crazy. Or you got to do what they tell you to do, right? When you come up with your own ideas of how you're going to get out, they don't like that. Because why? We didn't give that to you. And I think that's what people don't understand. And that's way bigger than us against the hedge funds. This is over the hedge funds. It's a way bigger game they play. Next one, no education. So let's follow the leader. We talked about that. Right? And excuse me for the typo. The leader had more margin for losses than everybody else. So the guy put in 50, he's sitting on 50 million. Right? So he put in 50K, he's sitting on 50 million. Hell, he can leave with $125,000. And that's still a hell of a run because you doubled your money. If you put in 50000 and a year later you pull out 100000 that's 100% return on your money in less than 12 months or 12 months. That's a hell of a run in any market. Real estate, bonds, equities, crypto, that's a hell of a run. You can put out 100000 that fast out of a $50,000 investment. People do that all day if they can do that. If they knew that I got a place to where in 12 months, I can put in 50,000, put out another 50,000 in 12 months. They'll do that for the rest of their life. They'll never quit doing it because I just keep doubling my money. Right. So with him putting in 50 and it being up 50 million, hell, if it go back down to 5 million, he still had a great run. So he had more margin for losses than everybody else. You putting in three, 4,000 and you sitting on 100,000, you don't have the margin for losses that this guy had, but it was no education in the space. It was just follow the leader. Because none of those people knew how to trade before they got over there. So they just doing what this person does and looking at him to give them the signal to quit. Uh -uh, we won't trade like that. And so that's one of the reasons why I stay out of a lot of these plays, because I see it's just a it's a wave. And the problem with it being a wave, if I don't understand what's going on, I'm gonna get caught on the wrong side of it. I don't care what everybody's doing because what everybody else is doing often don't mean you should do it. Right. So this play made a lot of people millionaires. It also lost a lot of people all their money because they was waiting for somebody else to tell them to sell. And I don't create those kind of environments. The goal of what I do is to teach you so you can make decisions for yourself. Now, we can collaborate. We can discuss it. We can have conversation around it. But I've seen being in this space a long period of time. There's something that happens to people before they ever come into the market. Where they haven't developed a certain aspect of their personality. To where once they start taking losses, it affirms to them why they need somebody else to tell them what to do. Do you need expert counsel? Yes, you do. I go to doctors. I go to mechanics. I go to attorneys. I go to CPAs. I do that. However, it has to be an aspect of you that has a basic understanding of what's going on. And these people didn't have a basic understanding of what's going on. And so we saw how, and I was talking about this with Miss Alexander, and there's two Miss Alexanders that I know the internet but this one miss alexander her husband is in the military so we're talking about when they invaded ukraine over a year ago now and the first thing they did was knock down communications right when the first thing you know I, 
like I said, I'm not, I'm not former military, but from my understanding, one of the first things you can do with military is you eliminate communications as an aspect of warfare, but it's really psychological warfare. So people can't talk to each other because if people can't talk to each other, what can they not? They don't have the ability to coordinate. So they, it's hard for them to coordinate an attack against you because why they can't talk, right? So what's their main web way in which they communicate? So with now it's the internet, right? It's the internet. It used, it used to be that 100 years ago, but now everybody's communicating to the internet, including the military. Now the military has other ways of communicating, but one of their ways to communicate is through the internet. So what do we notice in the movie that they did? When they wanted to put a hamper on this movement, what's the first thing they did? They took down Wall Street Bets. I remember, I remember when that happened. They took down Wall Street Bets. Now, I don't know who put that call in because it's Reddit. I'm like, what's going on? I didn't know they could do that, but they did it. And so by them doing that, everybody that was in that play could no longer communicate. So they all tried to run the Discord. And what they didn't show you in the movies, they shut down the Discord too. So there was something going on behind the scenes. There was calls being put in telling them to put up a damper on this situation. Right. And so without people having the ability to act in a decentralized way. Right. Where they've been trained to make decisions on themselves. So let me give an example. There's a really good movie about the revolution in Algiers and Algiers is in, in Africa. And these aren't really black people. They're like, I don't know. I, I don't know if you call them Berbers or Arabs. I don't know which one they are. They're Muslims, but they're not black people. But what they did in this revolution, they was in opposition to the French in Algiers. Is everybody worked in groups of three. Right. So me, another person and another person, we create a sale. We only talk to each other. All our activity is enclosed with each, with each other. We don't know anybody else. So we just do what we do in our group of three. So you know what that means? If something happens to us, we don't have anybody else to tell on. But we also don't get communication for anybody else. So we just build up our group of three. So we got one group of three might be five people. Another group might be four people. Another group might be six people. We all work with each other. We're a group of three. So we're three circles. Somebody else forms three more circles. Somebody else forms three more circles. Those circles do not know each other outside of the three. You don't seek to form groups with other circles. You work with your circle of three. So I'm in a group of five. I work with these other groups and we work with this other group and that's it. We don't deal with nobody else. What's the benefit of that? It's they can't shut everybody down at the same time. Right? So when you build a movement that this, that's this big and everybody's going to the one central place to get the information on what they should do next, what's the easiest thing to do? We just shut you down. Now everybody's lost. And they don't know what to do. And they don't have the education to build something on their own. Then what was the next thing they did? They went to Robin Hood and they didn't give them the ability to supply the play even more. This is another aspect of warfare. We destroy your ability to supply yourself. So what was feeding the play? More people buying the ticker. But how do we stop you from supplying yourself? We eliminate your ability to supply the ticker because they knew most of the people that were trading this was on what? Robin Hood. And they know that through what? Order flow information. They talked about that in the movie when the woman interviewed the guys that were IP on Robinhood. They said, well, how did Robinhood make money with their no commission trades? Well, they sell order flow, which means that they sell your order information to market makers. Robinhood is not a brokerage account. What they really do is just aggregate orders. And then they send the orders to somebody else and they execute the order for you. But what happens is what? They get to see all your orders. So the order, the market makers like Citadel, that are executing the orders, they know where all the orders are coming from. Because if you have the right type of technology, if an order is over a certain amount, you can see what exchange is going to be executed on. Right? So they were able to see that the majority of orders to buy GameStop were coming from this one place, which was Robinhood. So what do we do? We eliminate their ability to supply this situation by making it to where they can only sell, but they can no longer buy. Right? That's another aspect of warfare, where we destroy your ability to supply the people that are involved in the warfare. So now if you lose communication and you lose supply, you can't fight anymore. Right? Because you can't talk to each other and you built your movement around everybody being able to communicate to each other. And you also built your movement around us being able to get supplies. So once we go longer and longer without that, what happens is everybody starts to fall apart.
because they haven't been trained to do this on their own. So that's where the lack of education, right, and building everything around the one central leader who communicates to us in the one central place, right? And the only way for us to feed this play is to go through the one platform. What they really should have done is have everybody on different platforms. So everybody can be on Robin Hood. You got to be on Fidelity. You got to be on Think or Swim. You got to be da 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 da. So then they can't just shut us out by shutting out one. They got to shut out all the platforms to get rid of us because we're spread out. But like I said, we were in the era where everybody was on Robin Hood because it was the easiest one to bid on. I'm not against Robin Hood. I'm for it because Robin Hood got a lot of people into the markets. Let's go to the next point before we get up on out of here. Before it was GME, it was Tesla. After GME, it was AMC. There's going to be another play like this. And that's what I want you to really understand is that if you hang around the markets long enough, you're going to see this type of stuff happen over and over again. Now, NVIDIA is the hot play. There's always something. May not have the same narrative around it, but it's kind of often, often the same energy. So once you learn how this space operates, you learn the cycles of the space, you hang around long enough, you're going to see the same thing. If you live long enough you, and you look at the entertainment space, they put out the same archetype over and over again, just for that era. There's no change, right? The actual messaging is the same. How do people look may be different, right? But you got to hang around long enough to see that because what triggers people and what get people's attention and what makes people want to be part of something is the same because at the end of the day, you're still dealing with human beings. And human beings are going to be human beings. And we talk about that. They've been socialized the same way. They've ingested the same media. They've been around the same type of environments for decades and nothing has really changed in that particular aspect. It's easy to know what's going to get them on the hook again when they get desensitized to one situation. So we saw that people had got desensitized to Tesla. They jumped on GME. Then when GME fell off, everybody jumped on AMC. Now AMC fell off then everybody jumped into NVIDIA. It's always going to be something. It's never going to change. And NVIDIA gets high enough, in my opinion, the stock price gets high enough, they'll probably do a stock split, bring the thing back down, and it create more momentum for them and bring in a whole new group of buyers. That's how this game works. It don't change. Right? There will be another play just like GME. There will be another situation. What helped this guy, Roaring Kitty, is before GME started, he understood how markets worked. He understood how to evaluate companies. He understood how to actually invest and put money on companies. So when the situation went a certain way, he was able to take the majority of the advantage of it and other people were not because why? They didn't have the education. He had the education before it started. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. There's a marketer out of Cleveland, Ohio named Dan Kennedy. One thing I learned from him is he said the mistake people make in this country is they don't learn about money till they get in it. And he says it's not 100% their fault because they're worried about paying their bills, yada, yada, yada. But he says the, the downside of a lot of people in this country is they don't learn anything about money until they get it. And he says the problem is you want to know what to do with money before you get it. This guy, Roman Kitty, knew the markets. He understood how they worked. He understood how to actually move in the markets before they had ever made him rich. He had a net worth of $90,000. Right? So then when things started to move, he knew what to do. Everybody else had no understanding of it. So they just jumped on the bandwagon. Now that this situation is over, they still don't know what to do. And I think that's really the story of the movie. The woman that was a nurse that has a negative net worth, right? She still don't know what to do because she just jumped on the GME bandwagon. She knows how to catch the next bandwagon, right? She's just going to be left out here floundering. And I think that's the downside to the movie. But that's pretty much going to be it. Hope you got some value from it. David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, I'll talk to you later.